My name's Alex Stevens. I've uh, lived here in Medfield since 2010. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer by training. We'd actually looked at the property online for a few years before that, and when we saw that it was still on the market, we decided, hey, let's just go take a look, and it was sort of love at first sight, and we made an offer that was accepted, and we've been here since. So a grist mill was used to turn grain into flour or meal. Farmers would grow corn or wheat or oats, barley, rye, any of those kind of grains, and then would bring their harvest to the grist mill in town. This was one of several grist mills in Medfield dating back to the first settling of the town. So historically, from you know the dawn of antiquity until the 1800s, a grist mill would have been powered by water. So we have a mill pond and a dam the uh, miller would open up the sluiceway in the dam to send water into the mill. The mill would have a water wheel of some sort that would get turned by the force of the water. And then that water would turn a shaft that would have two millstones running very close to each other. The grain would be sent into an opening in the top. It would pass through the space between the two stones. And depending upon how close the stones were, it would determine how coarse or fine the, the flour or meal that came out would be. So one of the questions that a lot of people who might be walking by or visiting the house will ask is, who's John Adams, the builder of your house? Is that President John Adams? The biggest clue is the date of the house, 1676, predates the birth of President John Adams by about 50, 60 years. But what had happened was the Adams family living in Quincy and Braintree had maybe seven or eight kids in one generation. Almost all of them moved out here to Medfield, Walpole area. And the one who stayed behind in Braintree ended up being the ancestor of the president's Adams. So they are related, but they're something like second cousins or third cousins to several times removed to the John Adams who built our house. Charlie Kenny, who lived here from the 60s until he passed away, put together a booklet that documented the history of the house from and the property from the 1600s up until 2000. The, uh, the original room in the house, uh, upstairs and downstairs, dates to 1676. The main part of the house was expanded throughout the 1700s, and then an L was added onto the back in the 1800s. And there's a barn from about 1830. These two mill buildings here are from around that same time frame, so they're not the original mill buildings that would have been built in the 1600s. The original purpose of the house was, as a mill, was built right after the attack on the town during King Philip's War by the Native Americans. The mill was in operation for about 200 years and it passed through a number of different owners. So I believe that the people who owned this at one time owned all the way up through Rocky Woods, uh, all the way up Nebo Street and up into Rocky Woods. So that would have been you know, a thousand acres or something like that. And then in the late 1800s, the mill operators moved their business over to Park Street where Noonhill Grill is now. This became a summer house at first for people who lived in Boston. And then around 1920, it became a year-round residence. We have sort of the, uh, the house and just the, the surrounding acreage around that at this point. It seems to be a feature of this house is that when somebody moves out, they don't take all the things with them. So we have tools that have the names stamped on them of many different previous owners, going back to you know the 1800s anyway. There's a, what's either called a PV or a cant dog which is a pole with a hook on it, and that's used for rotating a log in the sawmill to get you some extra mechanical advantage. You hook the hook onto the log, and then you have a handle that you can crank the handle over and, and turn the log. Also a pair of ice tongs. So one of the other activities of people who lived here and any of the mill ponds or other ponds in town would have been to harvest ice in the winter before the days of mechanical refrigeration. So you would go out on the ice when the ice was thick enough and saw the ice into chunks, and then you would use the ice tongs to pick a big block of ice out of the water and drag it over to your ice shed. And then you would keep the ice packed in sawdust, which is convenient because you had a sawmill making plenty of sawdust. The ice would stay packed in sawdust until you needed it in the summer. And then the other artifact is a couple of measuring containers that the miller would have used to measure the flour that he was giving to the customer who brought the, the grain in. So my understanding of the way that that usually worked was that the farmer would bring their grain the miller would grind it and the miller would keep a fraction of the of the result as the payment. So the miller's share would be an eighth or you know, some fraction of the total uh, amount of flour that was made. So they would be able to measure how many cups or bushels or <laughs> whatever the measurement was using those different uh, devices. Right here in the dirt, when we uh, did a little bit of work 
fixing this fence here a few years ago, we found the two mating millstones that during the 1800s would have been taken out of the mill building and maybe somebody sat them there for a future use, but they became sort of buried over time and we uh, pulled them out. It's a piece of granite with the flutes carved into it for the flower to be able to work its way out from the, the center of the wheel to the edge. Most of the work that we've done is inside the house. There's five fireplaces, which we sort of made workable again, which they, you know, had sort of fallen into disrepair. We added insulation, which there wasn't any before. The historic windows in the front of the house all got restored to original condition. The grist mill and the sawmill had valves that the miller would open to let the water through the water wheel or the turbine to move the machinery. From a pond level management perspective, that's sort of my main pond job, I guess. And what I've done is put in an automatic monitoring system that tells me what the level is so I can look at it on my phone or on the computer, but from anywhere. If it rains a lot, then I open up some of the valves. When the rain tails off and the water level comes down, I close them. There's five different places where I can send water out. There's three valves at the grist mill, and then the waterfall I can adjust the height of. And then there's another valve that used to power the sawmill that I can open when there's a heavy rain. In the 13 years that we've been here, knock on wood, we have never had a major problem with overflowing. One of the things that was a little bit alarming was the old wooden bridge there. Before that was replaced, some of the stone foundation had fallen into the stream, but the town was good about you know, fixing that and getting it all back in working order, so that's all in good shape now. The attractive thing as a mechanical engineer was sort of the opportunity to have a whole backyard full of engineering projects. And we've got lots of wildlife that comes through, um, otters and heron and different kinds of ducks. So it's sort of like having a wildlife show in the backyard. The late afternoon, the light comes in from the west and shines into the trees on the other side, and it's just a nice place to unwind after the day. Are you a hobbyist, collector, artisan, or have a unique skill? If you are a Medfield community member and want to be featured on the show, contact us. For details, visit medfield.tv slash medfieldmoment.